In 1953, the United States started to deploy nuclear weapons in Europe to support NATO against a growing Soviet threat. This deployment provided the impetus for an unprecedented effort to provide security for these weapons of last resort. As early as 1960, it was clear that innovative safety and control devices would be necessary to meet U.S. and NATO political and military requirements. It was critical that nuclear weapons would always be available for use, if and only if authorized by the president. And they must never be subject to unauthorized use and must never detonate in an accident. The design features to ensure the safety, security, and reliability now associated with U.S. nuclear weapons did not happen overnight. The significant role of the national laboratories in that deliberate process is the subject of this documentary. Always, never. The assumption was Europe could be defended in one and only one way, and that was through the use of nuclear weapons. In Tula, Greenland, a nuclear bomber crashed, and if that had led to a nuclear explosion, beyond just a scattering of nuclear materials, we would have been very close on the edge of um, nuclear uh, war by accident. The initial weapons that were deployed were for the 280 millimeter cannon. And then shortly after that, there was uh, quite a uh, variety of weapons that were deployed that included not only the nuclear artillery, but the surface-to-surface -surface missiles. Uh, there were dual-capable aircraft. There were air defense artillery. And there was also atomic demolition munitions. Nuclear weapons got at the heart of NATO strategy very quickly from their initial deployment in 1953. Although the exact role, uh, exactly how and when they were going to be used, was often confusing and ambiguous. An historic day for America as President... In 1953, President Eisenhower would make nuclear weapons the centerpiece of national defense and the defense of Western Europe. Eisenhower decided that we were spending too much on the Department of Defense and cut back the planned level of expenditures. This was the new look. Uh, we, in the judgment of the administration, could not stand up against the hordes of Soviet soldiers that would be sent against the West, and therefore nuclear weapons were a substitute for maintaining massive conventional forces. The nuclearization of NATO was codified in MC48, a seminal planning document declaring that NATO forces would be able to initiate immediate defensive and retaliatory operations, including the use of atomic weapons. MC48 also called for the development of forces in being, underscoring the importance of a German contribution. Memories of World War II were very fresh. And so for NATO to make that decision to allow Germany to rearm uh, was a very difficult one. It almost took the whole world to bring Germany down in 1945. And it is this huge, huge weight 
in the balance of power, and and East and West are just really, really worried about which way that that power that country is going to go. That was the linchpin of the Cold War: was whether West Germany would stay firmly in the Western camp, or perhaps have some degree of movement toward a sort of a détente with the Warsaw Pact and with the Soviet Union. But the Allies remained committed to a Germany friendly to the West. By integrating West Germany within a system of European defense based on American nuclear power, NATO believed that German power could be contained. In October 1954, the Allies agreed to make West Germany a member of NATO, and in May 1955, bound by treaty, Chancellor Konrad Adenauer vowed that the Federal Republic of Germany would not produce or possess nuclear weapons. And our job was to ensure that they felt that we could deter Warsaw Pact attack, to assure that the prospect of the war fighting would not uh, uh, be so uh, frightening that uh, the political support for deterrence and for NATO would erode. NATO air forces must be alert at all times. To give them realistic training, a vast maneuver is held in June. Exercise carte blanche in the skies over western Germany. 3,000 aircraft from 11 nations take part. NATO's first war game involving tactical nuclear weapons was intended to demonstrate U.S. resolve and commitment. Twelve installations of the defending Fourth Allied Tactical Air Force are hit, four of them by simulated atomic bombs. Instead, the exercise exposed inherent contradictions of the nuclear battlefield. In the course of the exercise, there were 335 nuclear weapons dropped. There was an estimated 5 million casualties, uh, most of these in Germany. I used to fly over it with some of the Seventh Army people. It would be bad enough with so-called conventional capabilities, but nothing compared to what would happen if we had started using nuclear weapons. A difficulty, of course, was that those battlefield nuclear weapons would be used on German soil. And over time, the Germans would get increasingly restless about the way we were protecting them. The contradictions of the Cold War were well established by Eisenhower's second inaugural. Nuclear weapons would come to be seen as the glue that held NATO together, while their deterrent role would remain confusing and ambiguous. Soon, a second generation of tactical and strategic nuclear weapons would be dispersed in NATO, raising concerns not only about strategy, but also about nuclear safety and control. A new Middle East crisis arises as President Nasser of Egypt tells a wildly cheering crowd in Alexandria that Egypt has seized the internationally owned Suez Canal. Encircled by units from 15 Red Armored Divisions that have poured into Hungary, patriots fight to the last ditch. This is the death of liberty in Budapest. Against a backdrop of increasing East-West tensions, and despite deep ambivalence toward battlefield nuclear weapons, NATO planning proceeded apace, and in May 1957, the North Atlantic Council approved a new strategic document. MC-14-2, the massive retaliation strategy, was all out nuclear war. It was nothing short of that. So there was no distinction between tactical and strategic. Everything was going to be used. U.S. nuclear weapons deployed in Europe and closely coupled with forces of the Strategic Air Command would provide NATO with extended nuclear deterrence. Extended deterrence was challenged from Europe by Charles de Gaulle and others when Charles de Gaulle said, will the Americans sacrifice New York for Hamburg? Whether it was de Gaulle or uh, the British or the, uh, the Germans who didn't really believe that they could count on us for that sort of thing. America wouldn't be able to rely on the threat of deliberately, consciously launching a full-scale nuclear attack on the Soviet Union indefinitely. Today, a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. 
one of the great scientific feats of the age. I think people felt that the Soviets were speeding ahead of us in some sense. During the Suez venture, Khrushchev threatened to rain rockets down on Paris and London. Well, he didn't have the rockets to rain down on them at the time, but the Soviets were engaged in exaggerating their capabilities, and to some extent, that influenced our perception. To a large extent, that influenced our perception. It was very easy to move to a worst case mentality and think, oh my God, they're gonna go into production uh, very rapidly and soon have a very large ICBM force. Top secret reconnaissance of the Soviet Union would gradually undermine Khrushchev's boasts of missile superiority and bolster Eisenhower's confidence in the US strategic deterrent. But lacking this new intelligence, NATO political and military leaders shared the public's alarm. Eisenhower didn't want America to be the protector of Europe. So anything that pointed toward uh, an independent, strategically independent, unified Europe, you know, would fit in with the Eisenhower policy. Now that clearly meant that the Europeans would have to be armed with nuclear weapons. The idea was to share the nuclear burden and, and also complicate the planning for a Soviet first strike. It'd be that much harder for them to overrun NATO if the nuclear retaliation capacity was spread across more countries. At the 1957 emergency summit, Eisenhower agreed to establish a NATO atomic stockpile and offered to station intermediate range ballistic missiles at European bases. These IRBMs would be capable of reaching targets in the Soviet Union and were to be a stopgap until America's intercontinental ballistic missiles were ready. Congress had authorized this nuclear development on the proviso that U.S. would maintain custody of the nuclear weapon. But what did custody mean if the nuclear weapon was hanging under the wing of a German airplane piloted by a German pilot sitting on the tarmac ready to go? And on those bases, we had weapons, our weapons. And they were on a, what was called a quick reaction alert. Four airplanes were supposed to be, when they got the word, be airborne in five minutes. In every case where weapons were deployed to a specific NATO site, there was a US custodial presence. A few individuals, generally young custodians, that, had con that were the legal control of the weapons, embedded with, let's say, the German army. I can remember in the tour of NATO around 1958 that it would be very easy for the host nation or some faction in that nation to take over the nuclear facility. There was concern about foreign nationals, but also about commanders that might use them without proper authority. And of course, the European commander, who was an American commander, was eager to have them under his own control. But if nuclear war was fought, it would be fought with central U.S. systems in according to plan and not in reaction to uh, an event in the theater. In order to be sure of that, there had to be something a little bit better in a crisis situation. In 1958, as John Foster advanced the concept of use control at Livermore, Fred Clay was presenting a confidential report to his colleagues at RAND on the risk of an accidental or unauthorized nuclear detonation. About that time, we started to do alert of our bomber force because of the fear of surprise attack, that the bombs could be destroyed on the ground before they took off. But then it occurred to me, you know, uh, a deliberate attack is only one problem we have. If there's an accidental nuclear launch, you cannot dissuade an accident from happening. You have to prevent the accident. We had two basic recommendations. One was a two-man rule. 
At that time, one uh, authorized uh, sergeant from the Air Force uh, could move around a bomb that he could have brought to detonation. He might be psychotic, he might be alcoholic, he might be going through a terrible divorce, uh, he may be sleep deprived and make a, a mistake in the way he's carrying out nuclear weapon safety rules. You need a second person to ensure that these kinds of normal, natural human foibles don't cause some kind of nuclear accident or launch. So we recommended that not just relying on screening of the people in a two-man rule, but also on safety locks, to put it simply. It was a lock that would in turn this otherwise ready-to-go nuclear weapon into a dumb bomb until a code was inserted. And so it is a electrical break or a functional break of critical functions that are in the weapon. An acute need for change in nuclear safeguards and security was emerging independently within the defense community. By 1960, U.S. nuclear weapons were widely deployed to Europe, and Strategic Air Command was preparing for a full-time airborne alert mission. This posture of extended deterrence and high readiness carried with it new risks. Soon, action by Congress and the White House would crystallize around the concept of a coded lock for nuclear weapons that became known as the Permissive Action Link. There were three groups that separately stumbled their way onto thinking we needed something like a permissive action link. One was the labs themselves, then there was the executive branch, and the third group was in Congress, the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. And the fortunate thing is they all came together at the same time, the late 50s, early 60s. 57 to 62 was a period of, of drastic change to the nuclear arsenal particularly after weapons were placed on quick reaction alert uh, in Europe and in the United States. The customer, the military, wanted smaller devices, lighter, uh, lighter devices. And so the Los Alamos folks invented the idea of a sealed pit. When we developed what were called seal pit weapons, these were weapons where the fissile material was an integral part of the high explosive assembly mechanism. With sealed pits, you then were in a situation where the bomb was always ready to go. Now, as designs evolved and we went to seal pit, when all of the energy sources necessary were in one place, we didn't at first recognize the implications of the electrical system. We need some mechanism to protect us from that electrical energy that stops the flow of electrical energy directly into your, your charging system. In 1958, nuclear safety was an emerging discipline at the Atomic Energy Commission laboratories, and designers at Sandia were challenged to ensure the handling safety of the new sealed pit weapons. This pioneering effort in safety would pave the way for the first permissive action link. One of the things that was done was to try to include in the weapons some device that would determine the weapon was in the actual use environment. That is a device that would maintain a, a degree of electrical isolation within the warhead's electrical system until such time as the weapon sees a unique delivery environment. There is a class of weapon type called ADM, Atomic Demolition Munitions. These munitions were implanted just like a landmine. They had no environment to sense. The storage environment and the use environment were the same. They were just sitting there. And so the Army and the Marines chose to use a three-digit coded lock. Well, that also required someone to come up to the weapon to unlock it. And Sandia was asked to develop an electrical switch. A patterned controlled switch that could be installed in the ADM and then operated from a distance. 
At that time, they were not thinking about crypto. It was a safety concept, which was then converted over to a PAL-like device. It appeared to be that once the nascent PAL technology existed, coupled with growing concerns about accidental or unauthorized use, that change would be at hand. It was in October of 1960. We talked to a group, and it consisted mostly of majors and lieutenant colonels. After we finished the demonstration, one of them said, well, that's an interesting solution, but we don't have a problem that goes with it. One group was not pushing for this, and that was the military. The military, by and large, were satisfied with the procedures in place in the 1950s. The U.S. military tended to believe that it was necessary to have very high readiness for the sake of deterrence. Civilians often believed that, but often were also ready to sacrifice some readiness for the sake of operational safety or operational security. Eisenhower was much more concerned with operational readiness than he was with issues of civilian control. And readiness meant the control could not be too tight. What the Kennedy administration had inherited with regard to the control arrangements, they may have been, may have been quite surprised. In Washington, Senator Kennedy announces his choice for Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara. In the weeks preceding Kennedy's inaugural, before he and Robert McNamara confronted the hard reality of nuclear geopolitics, members of the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy inspected the custody and control of U.S. nuclear weapons in NATO. Los Alamos physicist Harold Agnew was invited to join this congressional tour. Everybody was in the act with our bombs, uh, all deployed all over Europe. In theory, we were supposed to have control over the weapons which were deployed with other NATO forces. In fact, it was a token custodial arrangement. We've been changing the nuclear arsenal and the NATO deployments drastically since 57. And, and there was reason to pause, have we done everything right? What the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy discovered in December 1960 was wildly more delegated than congressional staffers had intended. Now that NATO really has physical control of the delivery systems, and since we went to QRA, the warheads that are on those delivery systems, are those control elements possible? And it was on one of those trips to one of those installations where I was on an airfield with bombs hung under the wing, one bomb per airplane. I guess what got me was I saw this great big black German cross on the side of it. I walked up to the custodian, one GI, he wasn't even 20 years old, and I asked him, what are you going to do if these guys come running out and they're going to take off and no one has told you that it's all right. He, he wasn't quite sure what he should do. And I said, well, what you ought to do is just shoot at the bombs. There are four of them there hanging on. Shoot those things and don't worry about it. Uh, this idea of a custodian really wasn't very realistic. Could that really be viewed as, as presidential control of the U.S. asset? That's when uh, elements of the United States Congress began to question whether uh, we were operating legally within the framework of these programs of cooperation. The tour of NATO nations marked a turning point in the history of permissive action links. Familiar with the advanced work underway at Sandia, Harold Agnew filed his trip report in January 1961. Harold Agnew was familiar with some of this work because of his association with Don Cotter and others at Sandia. And Harold had been to many briefings at Sandia where MC-1541, this ADM solution, was discussed. And he and others recognized that this switch, if it had as an output, an encrypted code, 
could be used to put presidential authority back in the release process. I went back to the Joint Committee, and uh, with Don Cotter, we made a breadboard outfit, which we demonstrated to the Joint Committee as to what we were going to do. The embryonic PAL technology uh, that Sandia had been working on really as a, as a safety enhancement was seized upon as a solution to the legal dilemma. Another 18 months would pass before the new Kennedy administration would issue a presidential directive on PAL. The matter of sharing U.S. nuclear weapons with NATO allies was a hot topic in the Kennedy White House. The president and his national security advisor, McGeorge Bundy, immediately undertook a review of nuclear command and control. When the Kennedy administration got alerted, the whole question got opened up and, and asked, and it became an entirely different concern, not one of custody, but of presidential uh, release. Well, the president wants to have it both ways. He wants to be able, in the 1960s, to use nuclear weapons first if he feels it is absolutely necessary to protect the United States and our allies. But he wants to make sure that no one else makes that decision for him. Maintaining the cohesion of the Atlantic Alliance was a top priority for the new president. Yet in spring 1961, Kennedy approved a Department of Defense recommendation that no further nuclear weapons should be allocated for support of non-U.S. forces. Ongoing dispersals to NATO were halted, pending the results of further study. Premier Khrushchev arrives in Vienna for the first summit meeting with a U.S. president since the ill-starred conference with President Eisenhower in Paris. The talks go on for two days, and while they came to a limited agreement on Laos, there still appears to be sharp disagreement on Berlin nuclear testing. In early June 1961, when Kennedy and Khrushchev first met, the issues of custody and release authority for nuclear weapons in NATO were at once overshadowed and propelled by the crisis in West Berlin. The attention of an anxious world is focused on East and West Germany and Berlin. At the time, of course, West Berlin was isolated from the rest of the NATO, located in East Germany. One of the most important events was a Soviet attempt to take West Berlin. At the start of the crisis, the National Security Council met to discuss a memo on Berlin by former Secretary of State Dean Acheson. The NSC also discussed steps to strengthen U.S. physical custody of warheads in NATO, as well as preparing war plans for the use of nuclear weapons in Central Europe. The Berlin Task Force was basically saying, well, we would have a nominal response of U.S. forces and then we would have to appeal to nuclear weapons. That scared everyone, including probably the Soviets who had spies on the channels and realized that, that we were contemplating that. I called the SAC your Supreme Allied Commander, who was General Norstad, back to Washington. And I said, look, Larry, they did A, we did B, they did C, we did D. How is this thing going to evolve? He said, well, they'll do E, we'll do F, they'll do G, we'll do H, they'll do I. And I said, what do we do then? He said, well, he said, I guess we have to use nuclear weapons. Now, it was that kind of a situation. A situation in which Khrushchev sought to reverse the balance of nuclear power in Soviet favor by detonating a new super bomb. As Kennedy responded to the crisis, he continued to contemplate the prospect of an accidental or unauthorized nuclear detonation. The basic thrust of the Kennedy policy, of which the PALs were a component, was to make sure that control was exercised by the political leadership. That unless they could be controlled by the president, the president was going to consider pulling all nuclear weapons out of Europe. An accident or an incident at one of those bases, even though it may not be full nuclear or launch, uh, just wasn't in the national interest. The point was we needed something besides just the custodial team with their sidearms to, to invoke control. <laughs> 
Kennedy remained focused on the stability of NATO, and nuclear weapons were central to maintaining that alliance. On the occasion of Charter Day in March 1962, the president toured Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, where he saw promising new PAL technology. I think that had an impression on President Kennedy, but you need several people providing to the leadership, to the management, uh, some confidence that this is a serious problem and here is a solution to deal with it. We were able to provide prototype working hardware that, that people could understand and get a feel of what it would be in terms of the impact upon the weapons and the weapon systems. A consensus emerged to assure against unauthorized use, the never concept of nuclear weapons. A presidential directive was issued in June 1962, calling for PALs to be installed on all nuclear weapons dispersed to NATO commands for both non-U.S. and U.S. forces. Overall, there was an urgency to equip the NATO stockpile with something that interrupted critical electrical functionality inside the weapon and prevented the normal use of, of, the, of the nuclear device. We had PALs in weapons in Europe, coded switches installed starting in September of that year. NATO was involved in the installation of these weapons and the generation of the code management system. This was really their, their show. Uh, PAL was only an enabling hardware. The first generation PAL devices were motorized versions of the Sergeant Greenleaf lock that we used to find on all of our safes. It was literally uh, a, a combination lock attached to a system of motors and gears that would allow you to remotely manipulate the lock mechanism as opposed to twisting it with your fingers. MC-1541 represented the technology that we had at the time, which was electromechanical. It was a clockwork. You would put in a code and that would then shift around to see if does that number correspond to a stored position of a code wheel and then you would move to the next digit and do the next code wheel. And finally, when you get down to the fourth digit and you've got all four code wheels lined up, it would allow a gate to come down, which would press on another switch, which would then allow electrical current to flow to the weapon. Now the PAL device is integrated into the system. It's embedded and buried within the weapon system. And so an adversary would have to find his way down into the weapon system to be able to uh, uh, circumvent or bypass the uh, PAL device. The PAL, of course, is the device to permit administrative control by means of codes. That code could be held separate from the weapon, indeed could be held by the U.S. command authority and shared with the NATO ally only at the very last moment. So you separated the holders of weapons, the people that had, did the daily care and feeding, from those that authorized it. But the people who had to operate those systems initially uh, took it kind of personally. As a besmirching of, of their uh, loyalty and their responsibility. You don't trust us. It was a reflection on uh, faith, so to speak, or trust we had in them. And the other, which was really, uh, I found amusing, was what if we don't get the message? What if we don't get the codes? There were a number of operational issues that had to be addressed because this is a system that required external interaction with weapons support personnel. By the fall of 1962, the first permissive action links were installed on U.S. nuclear weapons in NATO, including those dispersed to U.S. forces on quick reaction alert. Both the Army and the Air Force immediately challenged PAL's reliability. There were problems in terms of the instructions as well as the hardware for charging batteries and storing batteries and those kind of things. I was sent to Europe to understand the specific nature and scope of the problems that the military was having. Not with the hardware that was in the weapons, the permissive action links, but the rest of the system that allowed that to work. 
We did not make uh, proponents immediately out of the services, but we certainly did uh, diffuse the level of, of anger and resentment. In a democracy like the United States, civilian control of the military means civilians must also control the use of nuclear weapons. What the PAL did is separated possession of the weapon from ability to make a nuclear detonation. You could possess the weapon and yet not be able to detonate it, at least not until you had received the PAL code. Initially, permissive action links were intended just for the weapons that would be shared with our NATO allies. But over time, the PAL concept migrated through the rest of the arsenal. Sir, the fail safe box. There must be some mistake. Check Omaha. The situation of concern is a SAC bomber crew launches a nuclear capable aircraft under positive control, flies out somewhere into northern Canada or into the Arctic and flies a turnaround pattern there until he receives a go directive from SAC headquarters. Can't get through, Colonel. And at some point, they would reach a failsafe line. And that line was generally drawn just outside of the air defense radar detection. Their standing rule was to turn around and come back home if they had not received orders to proceed to target. The thought was the high frequency communications that were available at the time uh, were not totally reliable. The crew is out there thinking that nuclear war is beginning or may have already begun. And in fact, may be responsible for the fact that they can't seem to talk to their headquarters. Here was a situation where people could imagine that the crew might work in concert and decide that they were gonna execute the mission without ever having received the presidential authorization. The Air Force was intensely focused on the nuclear mission, particularly in the 60s. So when you have those huge numbers of weapons out there, you have to have two concerns. Your primary concern is somebody accessing a weapon that intends to do you harm from the outside. But you also have the insider problem. One of the concerns in use control is being able to deal with an insider threat. And that's a very difficult thing to deal with. And that was to provide protection against unauthorized releasing of an armed weapon. The Air Force believed that they had in place uh, sufficient controls. They always saw PAL as a complication to the always, an impediment to them doing the job they were they were hired to do. And in fact, they had great faith in their, their own command control system. Regardless of how much you trust your own people and regardless of what kind of personnel reliability programs you have, if you've got that many weapons out there and that many people involved, then you have both the malicious insider concern and then you have the careless insider concern. Many within the defense community questioned whether dependence upon SAC's personnel reliability program and administrative controls were sufficient to prevent an unauthorized release. In 1967, after a high-level DOD review, SAC was directed to equip its bombers with a code-enabling switch. The code-enabling switch was really designed to prevent unauthorized action by an aircraft crew prior to their landing anywhere. Because the code enabling switch was positioned in a location that it would be very difficult for the crew to get to while the airplane was in flight. If you recall what the function of a PAL is, a PAL is to break critical arming and firing lines. Okay? It's buried deep within the system. A Bomber coded switch or CES is just another variant of a PAL just located in the aircraft and it breaks critical power lines 
to the weapon. By 1970, bomber-coated switches were being fielded in SAC B-52s, and a new generation of permissive action links was evolving to meet the needs of NATO nuclear policy, as well as a changing threat environment. At a time when the Europeans were again questioning U.S. resolve, the Nixon administration considered ways to strengthen NATO's nuclear options. My view was that selective nuclear strikes would persuade the Soviet Union that the United States would not be deterred from using nuclear weapons against Soviet territory. The threat of their use would condition how the Warsaw Pact forces would have to fight conventionally in such a way as to give us a conventional advantage. NATO's policy of flexible response required the capability of the selective release of nuclear weapons, unlocking a few, but not all. The multiple code capability of a new Category D PAL was an enabler of flexible response. Cat D PAL was the first implementation for multiple codes for selective release. They could release a small set of weapons, or they could have the option for release for a theater-wide response. The evolution of PAL devices followed both an increasing desire to provide operational flexibility and a desire to address vulnerabilities. Now, if you think about denying use to personnel that are not supposed to have access, if they ever get access, it, it's a little bit different problem. Use of denial was absolutely important when you looked at taking a weapon from a storage location and now putting it onto a delivery platform itself. During the Cold War, the main focus was always on the adversary, and we would run drills on having to launch. We would run drills on being a, a ground attack. By the 1970s, U.S. nuclear weapons were a mainstay of European defense. Use control systems, part of the never of nuclear weapons, had evolved to assure against unauthorized release, but also had to address the question of enemy overrun. And the answer to that was what was called nonviolent disablement. Critical elements of the nuclear weapon are irreversibly damaged reconfigured in such a way that the uh, weapon systems would not be functional uh, without a major reconstruction effort. The function of PAL is to maintain control until custody can be regained. There's no guarantees, but they do provide protection and delays. From ABC headquarters, just outside the Olympic Village in Munich, West Germany, the peace of what have been called the Serene Olympics was shattered just before dawn this morning, about five o'clock, when Arab terrorists went to the headquarters of the Israeli team and immediately killed one man. It was the first real armed terrorism event that caught public attention. Armed, dedicated team, well thought out, well planned, willing to die. Well, that's different than what we'd been dealing with before. We were dealing with, with enemies overrunning our territory. The possibility that terrorists might uh, attempt to uh, steal a U.S. nuclear weapon or even occupy a weapon storage site uh, uh, grew in its importance. The scenario you had to protect against there is a terrorist that seizes a nuclear weapon and then has days, even weeks, to overcome the use control devices ways were looked at for making the disruption or disablement automatic. An autonomously operating system that senses intrusions into the weapon and invoke uh, disablement automatically. By 1979, the terrorist threat loomed large in NATO planning. Studies of nuclear security were undertaken 
and systems were developed to thwart the actions of terrorists and assaulting forces. The lab engineers kept pace with the evolving threat, and by the 80s, the POWs that were being deployed on the new weapons were highly robust against tampering or seizure by terrorists. So the PAL certainly gave us a longer delay time if someone got access to a weapon that shouldn't have access to it. But it also gave you much more comfort that unless people were using the right processes, the right procedures, and were fully authorized, and were doing everything they were supposed to do, you know, that the weapon was more secure. Always to go off when you do need them, never to go off at any other time. These, of course, stress the command and control system. And the history of the nuclear age has been civilians and military wrestling with what civilian control of nuclear weapons means and coming to different understandings in different times shaped by events of the day and shaped by the evolution of technology. triangles are their primary targets, the squares are their secondary targets. The aircraft will begin penetrating Russian radar cover within uh, 25 minutes. General Turgidson, I find this very difficult to understand. I was under the impression that I was the only one in authority to order the use of nuclear weapons. Uh, that's right, sir. You are the only person authorized to do so. And although I... Uh, hate to judge before all the facts are in. It's beginning to look like uh, General Ripper exceeded his authority. Dr. Strangelove crystallized the always never problem and the civil military tension that underlay it. And the Strangelove scenario sketches a fanciful and absurd, really, way in which the military might go off the reservation. Uh, I want you to transmit plan R, R for Robert, to the wing. Plan R for Robert. Is it that bad, sir? It looks like it's pretty hairy. Yes, sir. Plan R for Robert, sir. It was about a commander who had been that, authorized to use nuclear command. weapons under certain circumstances, believing that those circumstances had come about, took actions against the wishes of the American president and the American secretary of defense. That was not an entirely far-fetched. It was an unlikely event, but it was not an impossible event at all. The president arrives at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida for a display of aerial might. By General Curtis LeMay, he sees a display of manned weapons. There was a fear on the part of some that uh, the military might be reckless, that they might be prepared in a crisis to use nuclear weapons. Eisenhower had a very different attitude towards this problem than did Kennedy. Eisenhower, as a former military commander, had a great deal of trust in the US military and would often delegate authority down to lower level commanders. The Eisenhower policy of pre-delegation had led to a situation where the SAC commander could, because of a failure on the phone lines between Washington and Omaha could authorize the use of nuclear weapons in an offensive manner against the Soviet Union, leading to a full-scale nuclear war. President Kennedy, unlike President Eisenhower, did not want that risk to remain. And the permissive action links were a way of establishing clear presidential control. In our academic world, we refer to that as the tension between positive control, do what you're told, and negative control, don't do it and we tell, until we tell you. It is very hard to assure both sides of that um, dilemma, always and never, at the same time. And in fact, the command and control system at any given point in time and at any given period in the nuclear history has favored one side or the other. Perhaps no single commander and military organization embodied the always never problem more than the enigmatic General Curtis LeMay and his vaunted Strategic Air Command. In 1958, LeMay listened with interest to Freddie Clay's RAND report on accidental or unauthorized use. 
almost by accident, the then Vice Chairman of the Air Force, General Curtis LeMay, heard about the briefing, and he says, I want to get the briefing. Should there be a nuclear accident in the United States that is blamed on our own forces, what would happen to his Air Force afterwards? And so he was known as a hardliner, as a guy who wanted to have his bombs ready to retaliate massively, but he also knew that this kind of a risk had to be reduced or eliminated. General LeMay dramatized a different problem with the nuclear command and control system. What do you do if all of the civilian leaders are gone? You could design the command and control system so that in such a case, it would fail impotent. Or you could design the system that says in that case, the military can retaliate with nuclear weapons regardless. And General LeMay argued for the latter system. And LeMay said, the pilot's an American, he'll know what to do. For General LeMay, the quantum leap in the destructiveness of nuclear weapons was profound, and he was determined to protect the United States from a bolt from the blue, like that which struck on a clear, hot summer morning. What some would call an absolute weapon focused the tension between military and civilian objectives, immediate availability versus deliberative decision-making about nuclear weapons. In the year following its use in World War II, the foundations of nuclear policy were established. President Truman transferred authority for this uniquely destructive weapon from military to civilian hands, while reserving the ultimate decision for its use to the president. Even at the very beginning, many of the themes that operated during the Cold War and still operate as we consider what to do with nuclear weapons were present. The first and most important one was a recognition that nuclear weapons were different from other military tools. A uniquely destructive weapon that had to be handled in a very different way. The spirit of the arrangement at that time was to keep nuclear weapons under civilian control and separated, if you will, from the operational military commands that would ultimately use them if they were to be used. To assure that uh, a wide range of views would be brought to bear on everything having to do with nuclear weapons. In which there was a division of responsibilities between those who were charged with designing, developing, producing, and manufacturing, and those who were charged with executing them in military operations. The Atomic Energy Act of 1946 created a civilian-led Atomic Energy Commission that would administer civilian and military uses of U.S. atomic power. The act also established clear civilian authority over the use of nuclear weapons vested in the president. And presidential authorization for use has continued to this day as the central feature of nuclear weapon command control. Over time, the balance between assertive presidential control and its delegation to the military varied with each administration. In 1987, President Reagan formalized nuclear command and control policy, assuring authorized use of nuclear weapons and assuring against unauthorized or inadvertent use. During the Cold War, it was our overriding concern that our forces be survivable to a first strike. In order to manage that risk, we had to accept other risks. You know, I mean, this, this business is all about risks. Doing that, you have to consider the, that the weapons would always be ready to maintain deterrence. 
but they should never be available for unauthorized uh, use or uh, never be subject to an accident. Political leaders need to think about where do they feel comfortable in this continuum between safety and reliability. And that's a delicate balance. During the Cold War, to manage the risks and strike a balance between always and never, the three Atomic Energy Commission nuclear laboratories continually evolved new technologies, improving the safety, control, reliability, and performance of nuclear weapons. Historically, developments in these different areas were often out of step with one another and with operational realities. As an agent of both always and never, technology would create new capabilities and spawn unexpected challenges. Nuclear detonation safety began with the first two atomic bombs in the summer of 1945, the days of Fat Man and Little Boy. On Tinian, North Field, there were four great parallel runways. They ran nearly across the total width of the island at that point. Oftentimes, there were accidents such that you could see burning B-29s in the vicinity of the runways. The little boy and the Nagasaki were not safe if we'd had an accident. If it dropped them, or if we'd crashed on takeoff from Mormon on Tinian, we would have we wiped out part of the 20th Air Force. We'd have lost. 400 B-29s and a lot of people. They were not safe. Well, the Nagasaki bomb, which was an implosion bomb, was built up by hand, and the uh, plutonium core was inside the high explosive. The bomb contained enough plutonium and was sufficiently close to being critical all by itself that there probably would have been some nuclear yield. Little Boy, the enriched uranium gun-type device, and Fat Man, the more complex plutonium implosion system, posed serious nuclear safety challenges. So one of the problems, of course, was to make weapons safe, and the only way we could do it was keep the fissile material separate from the assembly mechanism. Now, we didn't do that for Nagasaki. We just took off and hoped everything would be all right. Both bombs were fully loaded with fissile material at takeoff. Nuclear safety consisted of a system of green and red plugs. The principal safety measure in a loaded bomb, a bomb that was aboard the aircraft, was, the, uh, was electrical safety. The plugs essentially kept the circuits open from the power supply to the high explosive and its detonators. In flight, before the bomber was pressurized at 8,000 feet, we took out green plugs and installed red plugs. And with the uh, arming plugs in, that connection was made. So there was that physical action that had to be taken aboard the aircraft before the bomb was released. Wartime 1945 drove many hard decisions including the first use of two atomic bombs on Japan, one untested and both unsafe in an accident. From 1947 on through 1950, the Mark III bomb was the primary operational weapon. And this was a militarized version of a fat man. It wasn't a bomb, it was a collection of parts that had to be assembled by a specially trained team 
And so all the problems that existed with the weapon delivery over Nagasaki also existed with the Mark III. Meaning if some accident happened to it, uh, you would have a nuclear yield. So one of the design criteria for the Mark IV and all later weapons was that the nuclear capsule would be separate. The Mark IV was the first weapon to include a function we called in-flight insertion, which meant that the nuclear material in the form of a capsule could be moved along a track and put into the center of the weapon while it was on the way to the target. The next stage was, instead of doing that manually, was to build within the, the weapon itself a mechanism that would have the capsule external to the explosive. So Sandia developed an uh, in-flight insertion mechanism, which the pilot could turn on a switch and the mechanism would insert the capsule inside of the high explosive assembly. The back end of the capsule, of course, had that piece of high explosive, which made up the totality of the sphere. The initial generation of nuclear weapons were capsule-type weapons. A separable nuclear capsule served the interests of absolute nuclear safety, and for a short time, it also provided the means of civilian control. And in the very early days, civilian control of nuclear weapons meant civilian custody. And when they had an exercise, the sirens would go off, and the gate between the two fields, so to speak, with the military on one side and the atomic energy and the fissile material on the other side, the gate would be opened and there would be a transfer of material with receipts being signed. Over time, though, that arrangement proved unworkable. Uh, the military argued that in a crisis, this, this would delay a nuclear response when hours might matter. In 1950, this problem came to a head. The United Nations sent an army to Korea under a single command to hold the aggressors at bay. It was almost too late. Truman was petitioned by the Air Force of first the bombs and later the capsules for potential use in the Korean conflict. As the war in Korea escalated and threatened to develop into a global conflict, President Truman approved the transfer of nuclear components to the U.S. Air Force based in Britain. From the perspective of the Air Force, they did not enjoy the notion of not being allowed to deliver a nuclear weapon in time of war without the approval of this upstart civilian agency. The idea that nuclear weapons were actually going to be part of, the, integrated into American security, created a tremendous tension between this idea of civilian control and the ability of the military to plan for nuclear strikes. Withholding authority from the military was ludicrous to a commander like Curtis LeMay. There was tremendous pressure on the nuclear command and control system to shift from a never-oriented system to something that would be better able to respond in a crisis. And from that time on, the military had custody of nuclear weapons. There was this romance if I may use that expression, about nuclear weapons. It meant that the services, if they were to be relevant, which means getting funding from the administration and the Congress, had to be part of the charm circle of nuclear capabilities. So the Army strove to acquire nuclear weapons. The Navy in order to demonstrate its relevance in the period equipped its carriers with nuclear weapons. And of course the Air Force during that period was central to the buildup 
So every offensive capability they had had to become nuclear. Everyone had to have one. Now what happened in the early 50s, the specter of guided missiles entered the picture. And getting the missile to the target was a Department of Defense responsibility. Department of Defense for missiles and rockets was responsible for the arming signals, the safety to be provided outside of that nuclear warhead, and the fusing signals to tell it when to fire. A 1953 agreement carved out areas of responsibility between the DOD and the AEC. We ended up having to very specifically define where the interfaces were between the AEC hardware and the DOD supplied hardware. The interface literally was a connector through which the signals passed to initiate the arming sequence in the warhead. Sandia was becoming very concerned uh, about supplying a warhead that just uh, required an electrical input uh, to detonate. We're talking about delivering, let me call them, bare warheads to the services. A bare warhead would be vulnerable to any stray or intentional voltages. And on the right pair of pins, it could cause the weapon to go off. A massive nuclear weapons complex had taken shape in less than a decade, supported by an unbridled enthusiasm for all things nuclear. The 1953 Missile and Rockets Agreement was an addendum to a larger document spelling out AEC and DOD responsibilities for the complete life cycle of nuclear bombs and warheads. Soon, designers and engineers throughout the complex would discover and address the safety implications of this new generation of weapon systems. Fall 1950. A fierce international war rips through a small country on the North Yellow Sea called Korea. Russia has successfully detonated an atomic bomb we need to develop and produce a greater number and variety, and possibly even more powerful atomic weapons. Weapons tailored for specialized uses and targets. The services wanted a nuclear weapon for every conceivable purpose. In a report to the Joint Committee on Atomic Energy, tactical nuclear weapons represented the future they promised a revolution in land war. They were the natural answer to the armed hordes of the Soviet Union, and their coming would immeasurably strengthen Western Europe's will to resist. In the 1950s, we saw uh, weapons added at the rate of about three different types per year. The growth was dictated largely by the capacity of the plants. This is the mile-high city of Los Alamos the atomic city. This is a modern Pueblo created by the people of the United States as a research and development center for atomic weapons. Nuclear weapons were the product of a demonstration of a brand new capability by Los Alamos and the adoption of that by the military planners. And whatever we could do, they liked. Didn't matter what we, what we suggested, they liked it. They were very good customers. The early weapons were maintenance and intensive and uh, required uh, preparation time. The Mark Seven used perhaps 20 different complicated testers. We at Sandia felt that these procedures were causing more damage to the weapon than they were finding. In 1952, the Mark 7 bomb was one of the first fighter-delivered nuclear weapons. But by the late 1950s, the Air Force adopted a strike-ready posture and capsule-type weapons were deemed inconsistent with this new operational readiness. What they were giving to the military in terms of hardware was burdensome. Hidden under this security cover is the most destructive force ever devised by man, an atomic bomb. 
Well, clearly, the idea of having the military having to assemble the bomb didn't at all work with the five-minute alert concept. And that was the driver, one of the drivers for wooden bombs. In 1954, weapon designers envisioned a nuclear bomb that would provide operational simplicity or woodenness in which the required operational, maintenance, and safety care approaches that of a piece of pine. The concept was to try to come up with something, a bomb that could withstand years in storage and be instantly available for military use. In the earliest weapons, there was a lead acid battery used, which took three days to prepare. Characteristics of this type made it very difficult for the military to remain on alert. One of the developments that enabled uh, the wooden bomb was the advent of thermal batteries. These were batteries that were completely inert until torched, if you will, by an electrical signal. It was a dual-pronged approach. One, go to thermal batteries, become more test independent, and at the same time, I think, independently, the physics labs were trying to move towards a physics package design that allowed them to put the nuclear material inside the explosive itself. Los Alamos's new sealed pit primary was proof tested at Yucca Flats. Sealed pit technology was a revolution. And it allowed essentially immediate availability with the sealed pit, it was a package deal, so to speak. And in order for the military to be effective, they had a control of the whole system. We were always worried about what we call an accidental nuclear detonation. And when we had the sealed pit, we had to develop at the same time the concept of inherently one-point safe systems. Duncan McDougall at Los Alamos conceived of this notion that if you ignited the high explosive at a point, it would consume itself. Meaning that if in an accident, the high explosive were detonated at one point, it would not lead to a nuclear event. The calculations were done mainly by a man named Bob Osborne and the best we could do in guarantee with certainty was one chance in one million, that there'd be no yield greater than four pounds. And I had based this four pounds criteria on the basis that there might be an accident on a ship, and the uh, nuclear radiation from such an event could be contained within one of the compartments on the ship. The new sealed pit primaries prompted a change in the safety emphasis from controlling the nuclear material to controlling the electrical energy. In early 1957, there were 14 new weapon systems in the pipeline, all based on Los Alamos's sealed pit design. One of these 14 systems was the W-49, a warhead mated with the earliest intercontinental and intermediate range ballistic missiles. The 49 was the first of the warheads intended for re-entry vehicles that was small enough to be practical in a reasonable sized missile and still have a large yield. Early on, the Atomic Energy Commission provided the nuclear explosive package and the fire set. And the Department of Defense was responsible for the fusing system, which would deliver the proper signals to the warhead at the appropriate time to cause them to detonate. Arming and fusing signals, together with the source of power, were supplied to the warhead by the missile. To be compatible with DOD systems, you had to have a, an interface where the two came together, and that was a form of an ordinary connector with pins and sockets. I can remember in the military as a young lieutenant, my favorite tool was a voltometer because now I could troubleshoot the circuits in a logical way. It was just a simple matter of removing a plastic cap for weather protection and doing these tests. The concern grew about a friendly fiddler or someone just mistakenly uh, connecting a voltage up. 
and getting a very bad result. A single individual with information about schematics, which were widely available, and a battery in a lunchbox could detonate a nuclear weapon. This was not good. The W-49 was not considered to be an especially dangerous system or different than any in the past. It was just the time to begin stepping up to the plate, uh, change the situation that existed in the past of not having some kind of environmental protection in the, in the Sandia AEC hardware. I took it upon myself to authorize the design modification, if you will, to provide a first generation environmental sensing device, in this case, an accelerometer. No longer could you come up to the interface and put signals that would pass on down. It was a positive block until sometime in the deployment to the target, an environment was sensed that would allow that signal to pass. So there was an open switch, literally, the first open switch for safety. Sandia would address this problem and oversee the installation of environmental sensing devices in bombs and warheads throughout the stockpile. Comprehensive stockpile safety began with the work of the influential CLE committee report that spawned nearly 70 safety studies culminating in a Department of Defense directive establishing formal safety standards for nuclear weapon design. The CLE committee clearly influenced the future direction of safety, creating the positive measures. The positive measure concept was incredibly powerful in the sense of saying we need to see something that's engineered specifically for safety. Safety really means availability. If you have a safe weapon, you can deploy it anywhere in the world and not put the public at risk. By 1960, SAC was running an operation called Positive Control Launch to ensure the survivability of its bombers. This deployment of nuclear-armed B-52s would present new challenges for detonation safety. An atomic bomb breaks loose from a mounting shackle in a B-47 jet over Florence, South Carolina, plummets to Earth, causing a sensational freak accident. A Mark VI gravity bomb, accidentally dropped by an Air Force bomber, was of the earliest generation of capsule-type weapons. No nuclear capsule was aboard the bomber or installed in the weapon, and damage was limited to the detonation of the bomb's high explosive. The accident in March 1958 was the 13th involving air-delivered nuclear weapons. Six months later, the Strategic Air Command would begin to test its continuous airborne alert mission. During the next 10 years, the Air Force would be plagued by accidents involving air-delivered nuclear weapons. We were running some fairly high-risk operations. We were flying a large number of airplanes and during most of the 50s and into the 60s, continuously with nuclear weapons on board. Hardware wears out. Things happen. and. Uh, the Air Force caught the brunt of, uh, of those issues. Their focus was reliability, readiness, not accident safety. In the late 1950s, Strategic Air Command began to carry sealed pit weapons, where the bomb was loaded up and always ready to go. Accidents involving sealed pit weapons would represent a manifold change in the risks of an accidental nuclear detonation. One of the earliest accidents involving airborne alert bombers occurred in January 1961 over Goldsboro, North Carolina. It was a normal flight it had just refueled with a KC-135 tanker. The boom operator on the KC-135 told the pilot that he noticed a pink fluid 
leaking out of the right wing of the airplane. Pilot disengaged, radioed in to SAC headquarters to say that he had a fuel leak. B-52s are a big flying fuel tank, and it's necessary so that they stay in the air. You've got to transfer fuel from the center body of the aircraft out to the wings. During one of these transfer operations, the right wing of the airplane physically ripped off. All of a sudden, now that weapon system is free. As the weapon dropped, power was now coming on, and the arming rods had been pulled. The barrel switches began to operate. The next thing in the timing sequence was for the parachute to deploy. When it hit the ground, it tried to fire. There was still one safety device that had not operated. And that one safety device was the pre-arming switch, which is operated normally by a 28-volt signal. Some people can say, hey, the bomb worked exactly like designed. Others can say, all but one switch operated, and that one switch prevented the nuclear detonation. Unfortunately, there have been 30-some incidents where the ready-safe switch was operated inadvertently. We're fortunate that the weapons involved at Goldsboro were not suffering from that same malady. The accidents provided valuable information to AEC weapon designers. At Sandia, improvements were made in later generation pre-arming ready-safe switches. Unfortunately, there was no shortage of new data as the accidents continued. In January 1966, a mid-air collision over southern Spain raised international alarm. The accident over Palomares, I think, was significant because of the scattering of plutonium on foreign soil. It had incredible press coverage of that arena and an incredible negotiation between the U.S. government and the Spanish government with respect to the level of cleanup. We wound up buying up a lot of tomato fields over there. After the accidents, many things became more evident to us and, the, and in fact to the world because it was such a stage that they could see now. The U.S. was embarrassed in a world community. In early 1966, Strategic Air Command's Airborne Alert mission, codenamed Chrome Dome, had been operational for five years. Robert McNamara, who had been skeptical about whether the Chrome Dome operation was still necessary, wanted to put an end to it. Strategic Air Command was able to argue that that was a very rare event, it won't happen again, we've instituted operational procedures so that there won't be another accident of that sort. Unfortunately, they were wrong. B-52 on the airborne alert mission had a fire on board. The aircraft crew evacuated the aircraft. The plane then drifted without anyone on board, landing seven miles outside the base, blowing up on the ice. When the plane went down, it tended to melt the ice and then plate the thing, so you had a layer of ice over the top of the contamination. They had about 39 inches of ice when we got there, and of course they wanted to preserve all that ice they could for cleanup. And whenever there's an accident, political authorities quite rightly say, have we gotten this right? Sometimes they've said, that accident was not so damaging. It was a rare event, and we can live with it. Other times they've said, 
this was unacceptable. These were fairly serious incidents. They were international incidents. And we had to come to some grips that perhaps we needed to adjust our posture. And so we recognized that, hey, there's, there's a high consequence event that can happen here. It's unacceptable. We have to deal with it. Out of that came what we call the Walski criteria. Carl Walski, assistant to the Secretary of Defense, Atomic Energy, initiated a reappraisal of nuclear detonation safety in the wake of the 1966 Palomares accident. But the 1968 accident at the Thule Air Base in Greenland became a catalyst for change. The Walski criteria that was put out in 1968 gave two clear definitions of levels of safety for nuclear weapons. The key factor was given an accident, the likelihood of a nuclear detonation should be less than one in a million. And one in a billion for just sitting there, normal environments. Something that the US public in Congress and in the White House would understand. So we put a number on the level of safety. These accidents showed that you can have fire followed by crush, followed by electrical insult. A sequence of environments happening that uh, you may at one time deem not to be credible, but nature has a way of voting. Mother Nature's a devious uh, adversary. That's my personal view. Accidents are going to happen. Given the accident, how will the hardware how will the weapon system respond? Will it go the way I say it will, predict it will, design it will? Versus a system that's highly complex where it would not always fail predictably. So given that, we have developed a set of design principles from which we implement nuclear safety from the start into the weapon system design. In response to the 1968 Walski criteria, all three AEC laboratories intensified their focus on safety. Los Alamos would introduce insensitive high explosives. Livermore would develop fire-resistant pit technology. And Sandia would establish the enduring concept of enhanced nuclear detonation safety. Underlying all of these developments was a new understanding, indeed acceptance, of the probability of an accident. I think where we fool ourselves is we think we've thought of all the ways that accidents might occur. The key thing for weapon safety is given the accident, prevent the yield. The nuclear accidents of the 1960s shared common themes. They all exposed the weapon to extreme environmental insult, fire, crush, and electrical shock. By 1972, Sandia's Independent Safety Assessment Group would assemble evidence upsetting traditional understandings, findings that would forever shatter the image of order conveyed to the designer by circuit diagrams and layouts. Creating an independent safety group, I think, was absolutely vital and probably the key to why improvements were made. Jack Howard was strongly involved in encouraging an advanced development activity in a safety organization separate from the, from the warhead developers. If the design groups have somebody muttering constantly in their ear saying, always, Shouldn't there be somebody muttering, never? What we need is a simplifying notion. So a small group was convened, and I uh, isolated them and said, I don't want you working about day-to-day -day problems. Think this through. And so what I asked for Bill, well, we want to need some time, some months, to go in and really try to now understand safety from a more fundamental viewpoint. In 1968, Sandia designers asked, 
Are we doing what we need to be doing for abnormal environment safety? Their approach was twofold. Analyze the safety features of existing weapons and expose those components to severe abnormal environments. The feeling at the time was things are pretty good. We've had a lot of accidents. We've never had a, a detonation. People didn't, uh, at that time, understand much about accidents. Well, I think early on they assumed that uh, things could fail in such a way that the system wouldn't work. Key assumptions at the time held that an electrical fault to ground will dud the weapon and that circuits and connectors will open up in an accident. Early detonation safety was achieved by employing ready-safe switches environmental sensing devices like accelerometers, by using printed circuit boards and cable isolation to ensure the electrical integrity of the safety system. And safety was really on isolating the wires from the power coming in to pre-arm the weapon, for example, from the charging circuits. The early weapons were put together in such a way that this could all happen in the junction box and in the junction box, you have the inputs and outputs together on a wiring board. Wiring boards with all of these different paths in it, and then you maintain a separation between those paths, and then you put an insulative material, electrical insulation, over the top of it. You've made a cocoon around these items, and they're gonna be safe. But those were safety features in essentially normal environments. All of this hardware was developed in the vintage when the abnormal environment was not considered. Once you start involving fire and, and, and unusual environments in that, then you start shorting out cables and coming up with circuits that can cause a degradation of the safety that you've built into the bomb. After uh, several years of intensive uh, torturing of existing hardware, the study group found that the response was not predictable. When test objects were subjected to thermal insult by an electrical fault, the charred organic material would cease to insulate and now conduct electrical current. Conduction. And you can get conduction to many circuits in there. In other words, you're creating new electrical paths within, this, within your wiring board, and those electrical paths could go through and arm the weapon system and fire it. Charred insulation or melted solder would not simply open up a safety circuit and dud the weapon, but would cause unpredictable propagating damage. Further still, there was no technical basis for this model of safety practiced among designers. Their assessment and their analysis was not based on fact, was not based on testing. And this was a great uh, eureka, if you will, in the safety uh, arena, that we need an approach that allows for unpredictability. When you really start to build a safe nuclear weapon, your first task should be to create a barrier system to isolate the critical power from your critical arming and firing circuit. So you need a barrier. Barriarize those. And then you don't have to worry about what's happening outside. It was a simplifying notion because now you didn't have to study all the ways things could go wrong. So it made the problem manageable. In 1971, the Independent Safety Assessment Group proposed a radical redesign of all weapon electrical systems, beginning with the concept of an exclusion region. Where we isolate energy sources from critical nuclear weapon detonation elements to prevent a nuclear detonation. Exclusion barriers, which are walls that contain capacitor discharge units or the energy sources that can light off the detonators for the system but you don't have an operational weapon. To make an operational weapon, then you've got to essentially put a hole in the barrier to put in the arming energy when you need it. 
And we did this through what we call strong links, which are basically switching devices. So you keep this electrical energy off these elements like detonators. We used two strong links. We were unwilling to assume that we had the skills necessary to devise a single switch that would give us one in a million protection. Each one has to be independently effective to avoid some common mode failure. What you don't want is a common mode where with the same kind of input, both devices would, would fail. So we used two designed differently. And then the third thing you had to do is to make sure your strong links were not susceptible to just common everyday voltages. Some signal that would not normally be postulated during an accident. An unambiguous indication of human intent is what it needs to open that gate. That unique signal that was incompatible with all of the common voltages and the voltages as they may be modified by the abnormal environment. Ultimately, the features of enhanced nuclear detonation safety were designed to prevent nuclear yield in the face of severe abnormal environments. But eventually, everything fails. So now we'll, we'll make it fail in a predictable way. We deliberately designed some parts of the firing system to fail irreversibly, such as a high voltage capacitor. And so what you'd like to do is have something become inoperable. And so that was the concept of a weak link. And so you started co-locating you know, the strong links with the weak link so that as the environmental insult started to heat the weapon, you would have the weak link become inoperable before the strong link became ineffective. And so out of that work came the basic principles that have really stood up for years, isolation, inoperability and incompatibility. Some people have suggested a fourth principle of independence. That makes you safe. So that's, that was the great breakthrough, I think, that Stan Spray and his staff came up with. Enhanced nuclear detonation safety with strong links and weak links and meet the criteria of, of extreme safety, that was a clean, simple, and most efficient way in which anything that failed for whatever reason would neuter the system. Thinking back, that's kind of an obvious thing, maybe. But we didn't have it until these folks invented it. A requirement to change the design specifications so that you have more safety. I think it was just a gradual, natural evolution because we were always concerned about safety of, of the devices, especially as the numbers of them kept increasing and the deployment was pretty much worldwide. In the northwest corner of South Vietnam rests the small valley of Khe San. The siege is on. The North Vietnamese launch a massive artillery attack. U.S. commanders predict a major North Vietnamese offensive just before the Lunar New Year on January 30th. In late January 1968, the Johnson White House was consumed with the war in Vietnam. Coming just days before the North Vietnamese Tet Offensive, the Thule nuclear accident was almost a distraction. McNamara called for an immediate halt to SAC's airborne alert program. Chrome Dome is canceled because of the embarrassment and the costs involved with having a second nuclear accident. And yet, the interplay between the warning system and the offensive capability that Chrome Dome led us to have wasn't contemplated at the time. Indeed, when the B-52 crashed outside of Thule, senior officials in the Pentagon really didn't know that the reason why it was so close to Thule was because it was on this special Thule monitor mission. The B-52s on the airborne alert also had a second mission, which was to look down at American air defense radars to make sure that they were working properly. 
One of the concerns was that the Russians could take out one of the radars as a means of hiding the follow-on attack prior to a uh, major launch on the United States. But what happens if the airplane that crashed, the nuclear weapons on board, went off and destroyed the radar? There was a potential for an accident to occur that could have cascaded into a false warning. This kind of unusual interplay between a offensive nuclear system being kept up in the air, a defensive warning system, and the command and control never had been thought through. It was too unlikely an event. A low probability event that you'd have both the airplane crashing and the nuclear weapons going off within range of the radar to destroy it. But it wasn't infinitesimally small. Fortunately, the one-point safety system that had been placed on those bombs worked. But exceedingly rare events occur all the time. Generation exercises were a mainstay of SAC long after Thule happened because they were no longer flying Chrome Dome, but they still want to maintain operational readiness. We used to load the bombers up with a full load of bombs and pull them on the end of the runway and go to take off fire and roll down the runway. And then chop the fire and go off the runway on a high-speed taxiway and taxi back to the loader because we wanted that realism. We wanted assurance right up to pull back the yoke and take off that the crews could do everything. These were oftentimes referred to as elephant walks. So they continued to do all of the things of handling the bombs, uh, bringing them from the storage area, installing them on the clip-ins, putting them up on the bombers, and everything short of flying them. These could be fully loaded airplanes, fully loaded with fuel. And so it was quite taxing on the brakes to do this. And a number of situations occurred where the aircraft actually caught on fire because of hot brakes. SAC was continually putting themselves and the weapons at risk conducting these ground alert operations. It was generally well accepted by both the civilians and the military, the civilians and the AC and the military, that we had to have a posture that was survivable. In the interest of survivability, we have accepted some risks. Two departments have worked together very well in trying to mitigate those risks. Positive measures mitigating the safety risks of nuclear weapons were formally established in 1960. And from the beginning, Nuclear detonation safety was conceived of as a shared responsibility. It's the principal responsibility of the Department of Defense to assure that the abnormal environments don't occur very often. Uh, in fact, at a, at a diminishingly low level. But it is the laboratory's responsibility to assure that given an accident, that that will not be allowed to progress to a nuclear detonation. In late 1970, two years after the Sandia Safety Study Group began its work, the weak link, strong link concepts were formally briefed to the DOD. But acceptance of this new standard for safety design came slowly. Some of the discoveries were actually disbelieved by a number of designers. They wanted to believe their nice, orderly world, the one they were trained in and raised in, uh, this is the way electrical circuits behave. So we uh, arranged to make a display called the Burned Board Briefing. And people were seeing actual examples of what could happen. They were not just seeing view graphs and words about what might happen, they were seeing hardware about this, you know, this could happen. The idea of a burned board briefing originated with Bob Purifoy. After leading Sandia's successful design effort for the Navy, Purifoy became director of weapon development and undertook a complete review of the stockpile. I quickly became concerned about 
electrical system designs that would tolerate severe accidents. Those bombs that used high voltage thermally activated batteries. So all of those weapons could possibly be armed in the case of a fire that set off the high voltage thermal battery. The electrical systems of greatest concern were those of air delivered weapons on alert, those loaded up during SAC's generation exercises. In spring 1974, Sandia Vice President Glenn Fowler briefed the lab's concerns to the Division of Military Application at AEC headquarters. There was some reluctance on their part to greet that with any enthusiasm. The DOD felt, I think, that what they needed was more warfighting capability. They had enough safety. Fowler and Purifoy decided to go on record with their concerns. Glenn's memo expressed that these weapons should be upgraded with modern safety features or retired. Right away, people were indignant that the labs would blow the whistle on themselves. Words coming from the designers themselves can't easily be dismissed as uh, possibly false. And that caused no end of hysteria in Washington. The burned board briefing was arranged as a demonstration for key Washington decision makers. Among the first to receive the briefing was the assistant to the Secretary of Defense for Atomic Energy, Don Cotter. A former Sandian, Cotter found the briefing a sobering experience. In May 1975, he issued a directive for a joint safety evaluation of the entire stockpile give the DOD credit. Once they decided to go do the stockpile review, they went at it with, you know, enthusiasm and I think with a real hard look, not only this time at the weapon, but at the weapon system. Beginning in the summer of 1975, joint technical working groups were formed to evaluate each category of weapon and weapon system against modern safety standards. This was a joint review process. We had people from the laboratories and from the Department of Defense working together as a team to review the system. Strategic air-delivered weapon systems on alert were given first priority. The conclusion of the safety studies in spring 1977 coincided with more than a decade of advanced development work, yielding the first air-delivered weapon to fully incorporate enhanced electrical safety, the B-61 Mod 5. The B-61 got its start in the early to middle 60s. Everybody on the team would get a pep talk that we were working on the Cadillac of all bombs. The design architecture of the system was such that it allowed for a continuing uh, set of improvements uh, for achieving improved safety, particularly as well as improved uh, use control. This inherent safety and security would in time make its way through the rest of the modern stockpile. The B-61 established a modular architecture for nuclear weapons. The uh, firing set and the original 61s uh, eventually were replaced with firing sets in roughly the same volume that had modern uh, nuclear safety features and capabilities all integrated into the uh, firing set. And that's why packaging becomes so important when you're first laying out the design of a nuclear weapon. You can clearly put in strong links and weak links and have them totally ineffective if they're quite some distance apart. And that's the reason we co-locate and put them basically within the firing system itself. The modernization of the weapon systems didn't happen overnight. There were units that were out there that had no modern safety associated with them. It became more and more apparent that we need to review our entire stockpile. Improvements to older air-delivered systems began in 1979, 
a time when East-West relations were descending to new lows. During the 1980s, strategic and conventional arsenals expanded on both sides. A global anti-nuclear protest movement emerged. Nuclear arms control efforts were re-established, and a nuclear accident galvanized world opinion. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. By the end of the decade, sweeping political changes had overtaken well-laid plans for weapon system modernization. An era had ended when older systems were routinely replaced with new and safer designs. Ensuring the always and the never of nuclear weapons would at once become more public and more challenging. In the summer of 1962, 26 high-yield airdrops, proof tests of new and existing weapon designs, were conducted by the United States. In this, the last of the above-ground nuclear tests, the Atomic Energy Commission also tested advanced concepts for an anti-ballistic missile defense. Starfish Prime, was one of five high-altitude ABM tests. And in that event, we learned something about the effects on our satellites. We learned about the effects on aircraft that we had uh, operating at the time, and, and even at the events on Hawaii. Nearly a thousand miles away, the high-altitude electromagnetic pulse from Starfish Prime disrupted Hawaii's power grid and its telecommunications. The Starfish test gave us a much better appreciation for the extent to which EMP environments could propagate. The effects outside of the Earth's atmosphere were especially significant. The communication relay circuitry of Telstar 1, the prize of the satellite community, was an inadvertent casualty of the 1.4 megaton test. The effects of Starfish Prime also underscored known vulnerabilities of U.S. ballistic missile systems. By 1962, efforts were underway to ensure the never of nuclear weapons with PALs and safety retrofits, ensuring the always the nuclear weapon effects survivability of warheads now commanded equal attention. The earliest re-entry systems had not been sufficiently hardened against nuclear environments. So hardness was one of the big deals of Miniman II. We wanted the missile to be rad hard, starting from the re-entry vehicle down through the propulsion, including all the guidance electronics. Uh, rad hard, big deal. We spent a lot of money on that. May Day celebration in Moscow's Red Square, and the traditional parade features military equipment. When Galosh was revealed, it came as a shock, because we, by that time, realized we'd made fundamental error in, in the assumptions for the possibility of a ballistic missile defense on the part of the Soviets. Uh, when we got the technical intelligence that said that the Soviets uh, had proceeded down a different path altogether, uh, we were forced to deal with, with uh, exoatmospheric effects. The galosh really uh, put the stake in the ground for uh, pursuing hardness for all weapons in the future. The predominant vulnerability from a, from a weapon survivability perspective uh, varies depending upon whether you're looking at it 
exoatmospherically or endoatmospherically. Outside the atmosphere, X-rays will travel great distances because they're unattenuated by the vacuum of space. Be it the aeroshell, or the nuclear package, or the arming, fusing, and firing system, all portions of a reentry body are potentially vulnerable. In particular, the electronics had to be treated in such a way that, that it could survive rather heavy nuclear doses, and that meant not only making designs, but testing them. Underground testing in tunnels deep beneath the surface provides information about nuclear effects that cannot be obtained in any other way. Here in steel pipes, as much as one quarter of a mile long, specially tailored experiments yield up information that is vital to the design of new weapon systems. Quick closing shutters stop the debris from blowing down the pipe and wrecking the experiments, but permit X-rays and particles to reach their targets. As the Atomic Energy Commission began to address nuclear weapon effect survivability, the Department of Defense considered the strategic impact of a broad-based Soviet ballistic missile defense. We assumed that they wouldn't just defend Moscow, they would extend it across all of, all of Russia, all of the Soviet Union. And we had to think about how would we respond to that. How do we insulate ourselves against an expansion of the defense, an active nuclear-tipped defense? What do we do on the offensive side to assure penetration. There are two different, generically different ways of going about it. One of them was to penetrate by using penetration aids, which in effect denies the information needed to uh, discriminate the reentry bodies from uh, decoys. And that was the approach that was taken largely by the Air Force. And we'd done all kinds of experiments on decoys, uh, balloons, uh, chaff, you name it, always come to the conclusion finally that, look, uh, by the time you get down through the atmosphere, these things don't work very well. This year, more fleet ballistic missile submarines increase our nuclear deterrent powers on the seven seas. Each is ready to fire Polaris missiles from hidden launching platforms. We spent a lot of time and energy on penetration aids, particularly with Polaris. Uh, the so-called A3T, which had substantial penetration aid capability. But it also meant that we concluded that the best penetration aid is another warhead, and that led to Poseidon. A second approach to the problem of survivability was one advocated by Vice Admiral Levering Smith, the longtime director of the Navy's Special Projects Office. The quote of Levering Smith's is that we'll uh, make decoys, only we'll put a bomb in each one of them. In other words, the Poseidon was a vast expansion of the number of reentry bodies carried per missile. And basically, the idea was to overload the defense with so many reentry bodies that they were incapable of handling all of them at the same time. MERS that could substantially increase our offensive capability uh, was one way of doing it. In 1964, McNamara approved the development of multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles. MIRVs fulfilled a policy objective and offered the Navy new capabilities. You know, there's a real difference in uh, ballistic missile systems between Air Force systems and Navy systems. The real difference is uh, we, the Navy is very size, weight constrained. Small is important in the sense that because of the submarine limitations, uh, the Navy can't capriciously decide they want to have bigger missiles. Weight is always a concern to the Navy as it translates into throw range, which then converts into patrol area. In Poseidon, the desire was to get the smallest possible reentry body so we could put the largest number of them on the front end of this new Poseidon missile. 
And so it was a unique, an absolutely unique undertaking, and one upon which the performance of the Navy systems absolutely depended. Looking like a stub-wing pursuit ship, the Regulus churns up the water as it is blasted off the cruiser Helena. Like the other services, the Navy actively pursued a nuclear capability early on. In 1955, the fleet ballistic missile was conceived of as a complete system, put in place and maintained by the Navy's Special Projects Office. Polaris was on station by 1960. Guided first by Admiral Red Rayburn, the Navy's SPO would, through the practice of integration, deploy Poseidon in 1971. We could not afford carrying one extra pound of weight. We deliberately designed and wrote specifications for not the fusing system, not for a, an arming system or a warhead. We wrote our requirements for a reentry body, which was an integrated system. The notion of integration allows you to better manage packaging, mounting, and interfaces between two different assemblies. I believe integration bought for the Navy the ability to do the Mark III system. The traditional arming, fusing, and firing systems were sufficiently large that they had to be packaged in the back end of the reentry vehicle. As a result, a ballast had to be added in to offset the weight of this active hardware in the back of the body. If the arming and fusing and firing system could be miniaturized and integrated such that it could be packaged in what was otherwise ballast space in the front, then you could save much more than pound for pound in the design of the reentry body. To do that, we needed a uh some new thinking about the, about the arming and the fusing. Sandia and Lawrence and Los Alamos were in fact building reentry vehicles that would support the feasibility of small multiples. Ironically, the semiconductors so essential to small multiples opened the door to increased radiation effects. Miniaturization both required and enabled the developer to consider a wider range of design options. Through integration, if I've been able to save weight, I can now think about utilizing some of that weight margin for features that would allow me to enhance the radiation hardness of the design. So it's a matter of, of choosing the right elemental components. It's a matter of the proper circuit design. It meant that the uh, nuclear materials, uh, making sure that if they got to very high temperature, it wouldn't distort. They wanted to carry as many as 14 reentry bodies. Weight was extremely important to their achieving that number of bodies for the range they wanted. So ounces counted. There was no free lunch in the in the design of the of the Mark III reentry body, its warhead, or its arming, fusing, and firing system. Sandia together with its AEC partners, met the challenges and delivered a highly reliable, lightweight, radiation-hardened design fulfilling the Navy's objective of a survivable nuclear deterrent. The decision we made for the Mark III to use Sandia, it was something quite new. We didn't know how it was gonna work out. It turned out to work out very well indeed. Probably the two key thrusts that were enablers for the future were miniaturization and hardness. Those two together allowed us to meet sort of evolving stockpile needs for much harder from a radiation perspective, smaller, lighter reentry systems for the stockpile. In May 1972, anti-ballistic missile system development was checked by a landmark arms control agreement even as Nixon and Brezhnev signed the ABM Treaty, new threats were emerging to challenge the survivability of the U.S. strategic deterrent. Right after the Moscow summit, I was still director of Central Intelligence. Uh, there was a veritable explosion 
of research and development activities on the part of the Russians. The number of tests of Soviet missiles just expanded exponentially. The ICBMs, or the strategic offensive missiles that are deployed in the 1970s, carry multiple warheads, and they are more accurate, and therefore they do pose a greater threat to hardened targets in the U.S. In 1972, the Soviets deployed their first Delta-class ballistic missile submarine with a missile range of more than 4,000 miles. Late 60s, we became increasingly concerned about uh, potential anti-submarine warfare capabilities of the Soviets. It was believed by many that it was only a matter of time until a counter to the submarine was found. The oceans were going to be made transparent. And that led to a whole bunch of discussions and debates about survivability. For the Navy, survivability meant both penetrating Soviet defenses as well as shielding its sea-based platforms from detection. To enhance what the Navy called its pre-launch survivability, the Poseidon submarines could no longer cruise close to shore. From a survivability of the launch platform, uh, the larger the area you patrol in, the harder it is to detect where you're located. So going from the C-3 Poseidon to the C-4 Trident, we gained a tremendous increase in sea room. And also in order to keep the missile as effective at the greater range, we had to have some improvement in the accuracy. A highly integrative effort by the Navy and Sandia led to the Mark IV, a smaller, lighter weight, rad-hardened reentry body, which would become the most numerous of any nuclear weapon type deployed. And the C-4 missile would achieve a throw weight comparable to that of the Air Force's Minuteman III. But the Navy's nuclear mission remained unchanged, driven largely by the limitations of accuracy. The system served the same purpose as, as, the, uh, as on the Poseidon. To destroy urban industrial targets through defenses. So the development of longer range systems, in fact, becomes an enabler for much greater flexibility in terms of patrol area, greater flexibility in terms of target coverage. So you combine the uh, greater sea room with uh, greater accuracy and you have a more capable uh, system to target the enemy. As Trident I was ready to fulfill the Navy's nuclear mission, national policy was evolving in a new direction different from that served by sea-based forces directed at large urban industrial targets. A nuclear targeting policy review, prepared for the Carter administration, warned of the construction of deep underground shelters in the Moscow area. Evidence that the Soviet Union was planning to try to survive a nuclear war, ride out a nuclear war, with hardened bunkers for the command, with the deployment of the new systems, with hard target kill capability. Uh, all of this pointed to a very worrying kind of uh, image. The Soviets continued to develop and deploy strategic offensive nuclear forces Part of the Reagan campaign was to convince the Congress that this is what's going on. We never took that that seriously, you, you couldn't. But what we did conclude is that at least psychologically, uh, it was not acceptable to continue when the Soviets had this huge SS-18 with 10 warheads and the best we could do was a Minuteman with three warheads. Right at that time, we believe that the Russians were achieving an ability to take out with very high yield, very high precision warheads. 
missiles and warheads to be able to take out our ICBM force. Accuracies are being achieved on ICBMs. That meant that ICBMs were losing some of their credibility as a highly survivable basing. And we were going through the throes of a national, almost a crisis within the Department of Defense on how we were going to make that force survivable. We said we have to deploy the MX, or Peacekeeper. And the first thing we'll do is just put it in silos. And then we will look for alternative deployments. But that is not a stabilizing system. We're putting that in because we do have to repair parity between the forces. We needed to develop and deploy weapon systems based upon uh, considerations of what the other side would be prepared to do. You cannot simply uh, say we will deter without being able to execute in wartime. We then had a significant breakthrough with the deployment of the Trident II missile. This Trident II missile had both throw weight and accuracy. What we did with uh, D-5, Mark V, was to create a peacekeeper-like capability as part of the Seaborne strategic deterrent. The W88 Mark V system, what it provides is a significant increase in accuracy, and that's resulted from the D-5 missile and also from the integrated arming, fusing, and firing system that uh, Sandy and the Navy worked together to develop. It became capable of engaging essentially any interesting target. So with the high-yield W-88 warhead, the Trident II forced the Navy into thinking beyond the notions of counter value. Rather than a deterrent, which was mainly based on large area targets, we could focus more on uh, striking the military capability. On balance, it was decided to go with a higher yield system to be able to hold at risk those targets in the Soviet Union that were of very high concern to us. And so the maneuverability of quiet submarines was a guarantee, a, really a very high quality guarantee, of a survivable system that couldn't be targeted. In the mid-1980s, nuclear deterrence was best served by the strategically stable and survivable Trident II D-5 missile system, the development of which would prompt design decisions at the nexus of always and never. There was the tension between getting a high yield in the W-88 uh, because of a concern for being able to hold at risk uh, very hard targets uh, in the Soviet Union. Tension between that and the use of insensitive high explosives. Explosives used in the weapons primary that were less detonable in an accident. During the late 1960s, nuclear weapon accidents over Spain and Greenland raised international concerns about the dispersal of plutonium resulting from detonation of the bomb's high explosive. By 1970, weapon designers began to revisit what had been an old idea of developing an explosive for use in nuclear weapons that was less sensitive. But insensitive high explosive would come with design costs, added weight, and greater volume. At the labs, it became a uh, principal theme of uh, weapon design during the late 70s and early 80s. When I moved to the Pentagon in 1981, I took it as a little crusade on my part to embed in the uh, practices, regulations, uh, thinking of the Pentagon, the importance of IHE. During Mark V development, there was a consideration, designs around conventional HE and those involving insensitive HE. The designs at the time identified significant packaging impact 
we had a very unique missile system in which a third stage extended up through the post-boost vehicle deck, and the way we deployed warheads was in a fairly narrow annular ring around that third stage. During the Cold War, we wanted to get the maximum yield and the minimum size and weight package. We couldn't have gotten the capability that was needed for the mission out of the Mark V unless we went with the CHE, conventional high explosive. The use of conventional high explosive, requiring less volume, would enable a lighter, high yield reentry body with a base diameter conforming to the space available on the D5's through deck configuration. Conventional HE was insensitive enough to meet their standards for nuclear safety and to allow them also to meet their operational goals within an optimized design. I decided that uh, reliability of the design outweighed uh, the need for uh, IHE. I also uh, required the Navy to do a very extensive study of the handling of nuclear weapons in air custody. We basically went through the uh, strategic weapons facilities with a fine tooth comb to look at every phase of how the weapon was handled and looked at what could we do to improve the environment. And I believe it was the uh, thoroughness of that safety study that was the final deciding factor. Rapid development and testing of Trident II followed, the pace of which rivaled its predecessors, Poseidon and Polaris. By late 1989, the Trident II missile system was nearing its initial operational capability. At the same time, dramatic political changes were unfolding in Europe with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the prelude to German reunification and the unilateral withdrawal of Soviet forces from Eastern Europe, and a U.S.-Soviet summit yielding agreement on bilateral reductions in conventional forces. These events would spawn major unilateral reductions in U.S. nuclear forces, beginning with the de-alerting of the strategic bomber force. In this time frame, the safety of several U.S. nuclear weapon systems came under congressional scrutiny. Professor Sid Drell, he and Johnny Foster co-chaired a, a review committee on safety and security of nuclear weapons, IHE, and with some focus on the W88. We ended up focusing on uh, the probability that if the missile fell over, would the propellant states that maneuvered the reentry vehicles, would, would that uh, deflagrate, maybe even lead to a detonation? An accident where the missile flops down, uh, we didn't see that they had met the one-point safety criterion with confidence, based upon the analysis they had done then. And so then, since these concerns were raised, they tasked the Navy to do a study and to report back to the drill panel, and they looked at the design of the missile, design the warhead, and logistics and handling operations. And we proved the experimental and calculational pedigree of our estimates of missile safety. And to make a long story short, uh, chatting with the, with the folks from Sandia, they had performed the calculations. And those hydrodynamic calculations satisfied the experimental data. The added safety you bought by using insensitive high explosive still with that noble propellant was seen to be minimal. I had an opportunity to brief Drell and Towns and, and others down at Swift Land, and I believe their conclusions well after the study that it was a lot safer than they had anticipated in the beginning. Safe, secure, and reliable. And that was, that was job one, and we weren't going to waver from that. There's always a balance between the surety and safety features and the usability of the weapon. You can make the weapon so safe and so secure that you would have trouble using it in wartime if you had to. So the question is, in order to assure against, or never, are you willing to s sacrifice always? It's always a trade-off. More than 20 years have passed since the military requirements 
the always and the never of a nuclear weapons system were deliberated upon in response to an emerging threat environment. The world continues to change. We're living in a new threat environment, one that now includes terrorists with nuclear ambitions. The context for national security changed after the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. The September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks further altered our perception of the threat. And our nation's national security strategy is evolving to respond to new challenges. For more than 65 years, the U.S. nuclear security enterprise has met the nation's defense priorities. From the urgencies of a world at war in 1945 to the imperatives of the Cold War that followed. From the beginning, nuclear readiness and use control were of paramount importance. After a string of airborne accidents, nuclear safety increased in priority. And later, when U.S.-Soviet relations descended to their lowest point, new nuclear offensive capabilities were deployed. Throughout this history, the men and women of the Department of Energy and its national laboratories Los Alamos, Lawrence Livermore, and Sandia, along with the Department of Defense, have assured the safety, security, and effectiveness of U.S. nuclear weapons. This is a proud legacy and an ongoing endeavor to which all remain committed, maintaining an appropriate balance of always and never to sustain a credible nuclear deterrent.